Hi, welcome. Thanks for joining us again this week. The next three weeks, I want to look at a specific subject, and I really want us to spend some time looking at what the word says about something. Now, that something is going to be the topic of kingdom economics. Now, there's so much talk in the world today, so much fear concerning this thing that's being termed a financial crisis. So I really believe it's good stewardship for us to take time to look at what the Bible says concerning how we should be handling our finances in a time of famine or a time of financial crisis. Now, both the media and the economists of today are continually predicting bleak forecasts, aren't they, concerning the next few years and even the next few months, whether it's fuel costs or interest rates, inflation and any other of these things. They seem to be very hot topics at the moment, but there doesn't seem to be the same amount of good advice being given to us concerning how we should navigate our lives financially through what is being called a financial crisis. So as believers, I really believe that we're not just called or we shouldn't just listen or submit our hearts to bleak forecasts coming from differing media channels. Is there an option? Yes, I believe there is. I believe that our option as followers of Jesus, believers in God, is to turn to the word of God and say, Lord, how would you have me to live financially, to handle my finances during a time that's being branded financial crisis? But we turn to the Bible, not just for comfort or faith, but for instruction also. Now the Bible, here's the good news, the Bible has a lot to say about handling our finances and how we should operate financially in a time of famine or financial crisis. And over the next three weeks, we're gonna look at three specific topics regarding how a believer, that's you and me, should handle their finances, but we're gonna look at it from a biblical perspective. We're not listening to what the media or the secular news are saying to us. Rather, we're looking to the word of God, not just for comfort or faith, but for instruction. Lord, teach us how we should be operating financially in this time that's being branded a potential crisis. Now, over the next three weeks, we're going to look at three specific subjects. And I really believe it's important for us to revisit these subjects. Now, there's subjects that many of you would have heard of before if you've been walking with the Lord any amount of time. But I want to encourage you, don't shut off, don't lean back, rather lean in, have your Bibles ready, be ready to take notes over the next three weeks, because I really believe that God is going to speak to us as we look into his word about things that are going to give us courage, but also wisdom and instruction so that we can have a different experience of whatever may be coming next in the world than those who don't know or walk with the Lord. So the three subjects that we're going to be looking at is number one, good stewardship, <clears throat> being good stewards. Number two, that classic subject of tithing. What is it to tithe? What is tithing? And number three, living a lifestyle of sowing and reaping. Now, before we can look at good stewardship, we have to lay a platform that I call a platform of kingdom mindedness. Remember, the name of the topic or the subject that we're looking at over the next three weeks is kingdom economics. So for us to look at a different way of economy or a different option of economy, we have to recognize first the presence of a different kingdom. So this could be titled having a kingdom identity. You say, well, what's this got to be, do with money? What's this got to do with me handling my finances and my resources? Well, actually quite a lot because the kingdom you identify with that will determine the ways, the rules and the laws that you choose to live by. So what do we mean by kingdom economics? We mean the recognition of an alternate kingdom present 
here and now that our lives are a part of. So when we speak about the kingdom of God, we're recognizing that the kingdom of God is with us. The kingdom of God is in us. The kingdom of God isn't something we experience one day when we die, but it's a very present realm, a rule and reign in the here and now that our lives are to be subject to and citizens of. So when we understand that the kingdom of God is present in this life, we also then need to make decisions. Are we going to be citizens of this new kingdom? Or are we going to keep living by the rules and the ways of the one that we once belonged to before we were gloriously saved in and through Christ? So when we understand that we're a part of another kingdom, it's vital for us to understand that a great definition of kingdom <clears throat> is simply rule and reign. So the kingdom of God is present here on earth, present in our lives. Kingdom means the rule and reign of someone. Now we recognize that Christ is now our king. His kingdom is now our kingdom. And we're to now, as citizens of that kingdom, submit our lives to the ways or the laws or the principles of that kingdom. So it starts with us understanding the wonderful announcement of Colossians 1.13, that God in Christ has already taken us from the kingdom or the system of this world and translated us and brought us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. So when we understand that we're now citizens of God's kingdom, not just in the life to come, but right here, right now, then we have a choice to be true to the ways of the kingdom that God has now positioned us in. Not just with certain aspects of our lives, maybe our morality, our relationship, our love for other people, the way that we treat other people, but also how we handle everyday things that God has entrusted us with, like finances and resources. Now, a great example of this for me is found in the story of the prodigal son or the wayward child. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. You're introduced to a son who's present in one kingdom and then through deception, foolishness, he decides to take from his father everything that's his inheritance. And then he goes off to another kingdom where he squanders it and you realize and read the story but later on he wakes up in a pigsty and he says I need to go back to my father's house another way of putting that is I need to go back to my father's kingdom and so he leaves the kingdom that he'd gone into and it was that kingdom that had made him wayward and he comes back into the kingdom of his father and we love that story where the father welcomes him back, gives him a robe, a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, begins to treat him as a son and no longer a servant. But also when we read this story, this parable of the prodigal son, it gives us a beautiful picture of two different kingdoms, specifically two different financial kingdoms that are present at once, giving two different experiences. Remember the son starts in the kingdom of his father. He has no lack. He has no want. He needs nothing. Everything is taken care of. He's living under the rule and reign of his father and he has more than he could ever need. Through foolishness he leaves that kingdom and goes into the kingdom that's the wayward kingdom. We could consider that the kingdom of the world, life without God, the way that God um, would not have us to live, a world represented by worldly wisdom. But notice what happens is as soon as the son leaves his father's kingdom, comes out from under the rule and reign of his dad's house, he comes into a kingdom that doesn't add to his resources, Rather, within a very short amount of time, he's got nothing left. 
he's eating pig food. That is such a great parallel of the financial system of this world and the agenda of the financial system of this world. It doesn't want to bring you into abundance. It wants to rob you, steal from you, kill, steal and destroy, cause you to experience lack. But the good news is that just as the child of this household returned to his true home, so that's what we do when we're born again. So when we, we're born again, we're like that prodigal son that comes home to his father's kingdom. Now, here's the good news about this story. The moment the son steps into his father's kingdom, he no longer lives in and experiences the lack of the world system that he had been experiencing. Why? Because he came under the rule and reign or the way of doing things of his father's kingdom. And living in his father's kingdom by the way that the father taught to live, suddenly his life went from lack and not enough to again living a life where all of his needs were met and he was blessed. We need to understand it's not good enough for us to recognize ourselves merely as people who are saved or people that are now a part of God's kingdom. But also we're a people that say, I'm not going to handle my finances, my resources in the way that the world is instructing me to. Rather, I'm going to look to the word of God, which represents the ways of God to see how I handle these natural things in my life called resources and money. So when we have a kingdom mindedness, we know what kingdom we're now of. Then we can begin to look at the subject of good stewardship. Let's start with three really important, honest questions, okay? Three very important, brutal, honest questions about stewardship. Number one, do you see yourself as an owner or a steward of the stuff in your life? Number two, whose money and resource actually is it? And number three, what would you have without God and his ability working in your life. So three very, very important, blunt, honest questions that I really believe we get a good response or answer from when we read the book of Deuteronomy chapter eight, reading from verses 10 to 18. God is speaking to a people that he'd taken care of. Now listen to this conversation between God and the people that he'd been caring for. When you have eaten and are satisfied, Praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Always remember the good land that God has brought you into. <clears throat> Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and his decrees that he has given you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build your fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and your flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and everything that you have has multiplied, which is God's desire for your life, then your heart can become proud and you can forget the Lord your God who brought you out of captivity and out of a land of slavery that you once knew. What God's saying is when things get good, don't forget who made them good. When you find yourself living in a good place, don't forget the one who brought you into that good place. Then in verse 15, he says, he led you through the vast dreadful wilderness, that thirsty waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He, he brought you water out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that at the end it might go well for you. Even in God leading the children of Israel through the wilderness, he had an end agenda that it might go well for them. But this is the part I want to underline when we look at those three questions we asked about who owns the stuff that we've got? Where did the stuff that we have come from? And it says in verse 17, you may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth that's in my life. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability 
to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to his ancestors, as it still remains true today. So what God's saying is, remember, you had seasons in your life that maybe weren't strong financially or filled with provision. God's goodness carried you through those times. God, God's goodness brings you into a place of strength and ability. But be careful when you're in that place of strength and ability not to forget God, not to forget that it's by his ability. His ability gives us the power to gain and earn wealth. Now, the truth is, we are stewards of what God has given us and entrusted us. Therefore, we need to always view our life through a lens of stewardship, not of ownership. Ownership says, this is mine, this is mine, I do what I want with it. Stewardship says, I'm taking care of this because somebody has entrusted it to me. Two different ways of thinking. Now, when it comes to um, stewardship in the New Testament, if you're making notes, and I hope that you are, make a note of 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 10, where it says that we're to use whatever grace God has given us to serve others as stewards. Also make a note of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, where it says stewards must show themselves faithful with what has been entrusted to them. So number one in Peter, it says that God gives us grace. And with that grace, we're to take care of others or serve others, seeing ourselves as stewards, not owners, but also in Corinthians, that we need to be faithful with what has been entrusted into our care or management. Now, this is a story that starts in the opening of Genesis, isn't it? In Genesis 1, 28, we see God make man, create man in his image and in his likeness. And then we see him position man and give him rulership or stewardship over Eden or the garden that God had created. That God made man and positioned them to rule and reign over what belonged to him. In the same way, God causes us to be born again and he positions us in life to watch over, to manage, to rule and reign in the things that he entrusts to us. Some of those things are spiritual, other times they're practical. The money that we have, the resources we have, the homes we have, the things that he's blessed us with. Let's be careful to remember what Deuteronomy 8 says. Let's not forget God in our success. Now, as stewards, we now see ourselves as being given responsibility to handle and manage what he entrusts to our lives, but also in his church. You see, when we see ourselves as stewards as what belongs to God, it's not just what he's giving us, it's what he's giving us in his church so that his church can do or that it's called to do as well. I want to encourage you. We need to see ourselves as having open hands rather than clenched fists. This is something I've always taught when it came to stewardship of finances. We've got to make sure that we're not living with clenched fists that says it's mine I'm an owner it's mine I got it my strength my inheritance it was me I positioned myself to be taken care of financially clenched fists but rather we would be a people with open hands Lord thank you I have nothing that you didn't give me you know you may argue with me and say well I'm a self-made man my response to that is your problem is you worship the one that made you. None of us are self-made. All of us are here because God gave us breath. All of us are strong because God gave us strength. All of us have ability because God gave us ability. You may say to me, that's a very narrow way of seeing it, Andy. Absolutely. I believe that the Bible calls us to look at who we are and what we have through a narrow lens of biblical perspective. Listen, our confidence is in him 
we live, we move, we have our being. But the outworking of that is we are nothing and we have nothing that he didn't first give to us. Now, as stewards, we don't live with closed fists, but we say, Lord, feel free to use what you've given me for other people, but also for your church. Now, there's a lovely expression that I've always heard that puts this so well. And maybe you've heard this expression before. It simply says, if he can get it through us, he will get it to us. You see, God looks at our heart and he looks to see if we've got the closed fists of ownership where it's all mine. It's mine. I do what I want with it. Or the open hands of stewardship. Thank you, Lord, for what you've blessed me with. I have nothing outside of what you've given me. Even the ability and the strength that I've used to produce wealth in my life, that strength and ability comes from you. So, Lord, with what you've blessed me, use my life to also bless others. You see, it's about seeing money and stuff for what they are, but also what they're not. Here's three very big warnings for you regarding your money, your finances, your resources. <clears throat> They're not to be abused or wasted. You see, when you understand that all that you have is given by God and you are a steward of things. You know, when I consider my children, I know that I'm a parent. But from the moment the first child was born, I always saw my life as a steward over those children rather than a sole owner. I always knew that God had entrusted my children to me to raise, to care for, but he always has purposes for them. In the same way, if I'm going to do that with, with something so valuable like my children, why would I not look that way at the other things in my life like money and resource? Now, God wants us to see things as his entrusted to us. And when we do, we won't want to abuse or waste resources or finances. Another one is they're not to be stored or hoarded. I'm not against investment when the Lord leads you to invest. I'm not against pensions when the Lord causes you to invest in pensions. I'm against that heart that's scared stiff that God won't provide, that places its confidence in hoarding and storing. I will be all right if I hoard and store. Remember what the Lord said about the man that filled his barns and then filled more barns. And he says, you fool, do you not realize that your life could be required of you tonight? When I read that parable, it makes me think that, you know, when you watch things like the Wall Street crash many decades ago, you saw that people can store and hoard, but in a moment you can lose everything. But if you're the owner of your life, your life has just been destroyed. But if you're a steward of your life, you know that God brought it. It may have gone, but God can bring it back again. It's much safer living with a lens of stewardship than sole ownership. So finances should never be abused or wasted because though they're in our lives, we're stewards of them. They shouldn't be stored or hoarded. Equally, they should never be worshipped or served. Sadly, people today do choose to not use money, but worship money, find their security, their significance, and other things concerning the character of who they are in worldly things like finances, resources, and money, instead of finding those things in God. What have they done? The same as the people in that verse in Deuteronomy. They've forgotten that it's the Lord who is the source of their life. Now, it sadly becomes the master of some people. Like I said, something that they don't use anymore, but something that they serve, crave, worship. It was never meant to be that way. Jesus warned us about this way of living in a statement that he made in Matthew chapter 6. Again, if you're reading and making notes today, it's Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. And he says this statement. This is the Lord speaking. 
No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Now, what Jesus is saying is in comparison, there can only be one thing in your life that stands out among the rest. And then Jesus makes this statement. You cannot or you should not serve both God and money. Now, the word there used for money is the word mammon. And it's not speaking so much of the physical stuff that we use as a commodity, we, the, the physical banknotes or the coins. He's speaking about a spirit that serves money. Mammon was a spirit that served money. That money became to people in that time, like it is today, something that was worshipped, craved, um, something that gave significance. Jesus was saying, don't serve money. Use money. Use money for good things. Use money for blessing others. Use money for, for building the kingdom of God on earth, establishing the covenant of God on earth. But don't worship money. Don't serve money. Don't make it the ruler of your life, the thing that defines you, the thing that you wake up every morning to serve. Jesus said, no, don't serve money, serve God. Now, when we make a heart within us to serve God, actually money finds its correct place as something that God wants to bless us with and for us to use to bless others. Now, you may have heard people say before in preaching rants, oh, money is evil. No, money isn't evil. Money, as in the currency and the commodity, the coin and the note, that's not evil. It's actually neutral. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says that, that it's the love of, not money, it's the love of money that's the root or the beginning of all evil. Money is neutral. If you put it in the hands of good people, it can do good things. Put it in the hands of bad people, it can do bad things. Money hasn't got a character of its own, but there can be a spirit, a mammon spirit, that loves money, that can cause money to do, be, and go where it never should have. When we're stewards of money, what we do is we recognize, though it's in our possession, the Lord has entrusted us with the responsibility of good stewardship. And Jesus spoke often about good stewardship, didn't he? There were verses that you can read about in Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 13, where he spoke about bad stewardship and handling wealth. Also, Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30, he speaks of how he came and entrusted certain people with talents and the level of their stewardship in handling those talents was what determined whether they experienced more or less. God wasn't scared to speak about money. Jesus spoke about money. We need to understand that when we're coming through something called a financial crisis by the world, the economists of the day, we should never let fear into our hearts, but we equally, we shouldn't look to the wisdom of a broken financial system to find a way of living that will successfully navigate us through a financial crisis. Here's a headline you need to understand. There's been financial crises before. There's been financial famines before. Speak to your grandparents what it was like to live in the world. Of, of a wartime when there wasn't a banana for five years where people shared water at the end of the street where there was no heat and there was no food speak to people of a couple of generations ago and you'll see there were lean times in history this isn't the first time when there's been something that they're terming a financial crisis read in the bible there were famines there were times of famine but also note that those who were committed to god that had set their heart on stewardship on serving god and not stuff the lord always 
caused them to navigate successfully through these seasons, even when the neighbours and the friends around them that didn't acknowledge God were falling and crumbling. There was a good hand of God upon those who were living by kingdom principles regarding how you handle stuff, not just in good times of blessing, but in times of stretching. So stewardship, I believe, has a natural dimension to it, but also a spiritual one. It would be wrong today not to speak of a natural dimension of good stewardship. What do I mean by that? That as we're going into a time where they're saying inflation, prices going up, fuel costs, etc., etc., it's a never-ending list. It's a good thing to use the wisdom of God to be checking that there's no waste in your lives and budgets. This is a great time to apply natural good stewardship um, principles. Look through your budgets. Make sure you're not wasting money on things you shouldn't be wasting money at. Look at your disposable income. Look at what's eating away at any disposable income. How much coffee do you buy each week? What are you wasting money on because you could once before, but you really can't in the time that we're living? So I want to call you not to rule out natural uh, approach to this, be checking if there's waste in your life, some budgets. Be cutting back where you need to so that the finances and the resources of your life are being spent on the things that you need, not the things you want. Go through your budgets, manage your income, look at your income versus your outgoing. I don't want to not mention these things today because a part of natural stewardship is us taking natural responsibility to check there's not waste in our life. Because if we're wasting money in our life, how can we say to God, we need more money? Isn't he going to respond, well, you need to stop wasting money that you currently are wasting. Not that he can't bring addition to your life, but he's not a God that loves waste. So I want to encourage you, be faithful in this season as we navigate through what's being called a financial crisis, to check your budgets, look at your outgoings, look at the money coming in versus the money going out. Speak to people who are wise with handling money. Get people to help you to build a correct budget in your life. All of these things, I believe, are important. But spiritually, it's also about recognising that you are managing and taking care of what he's entrusted you with. And you're acknowledging him in all of your ways, including the ways that involve finance and resources. Now, next week, we're going to begin to really dig into some of the key aspects of what the word of God teaches regarding how we should handle our finances in a way that God considers righteous and correct. We're going to look next week at the um, conversation of tithing, Please don't shut off. Don't lean back. Lean in. God could speak something new to you that causes just a revolution in your life. The week after, we're going to look at what it is to have a lifestyle of sowing and reaping. So like I said at the beginning, this next three weeks today and the next two Sundays, the next two uh, broadcasts are dedicated to looking at the subject of kingdom economy and how we can successfully navigate our lives through what the world says is a financial crisis that could last months and years. God's got a plan for you. God's got purposes for you. We're turning away from the wisdom of the world that still doesn't really know what it believes itself to the wisdom of God, the one who created us, the one who's positioned us to be blessed but also a blessing to others and actively involved in seeing his kingdom come on the earth. Hope this excites you. Listen, read back over the verses. Take time to pray. Let's let the Lord instruct us in this time so that we can walk through whatever season is coming with a fearlessness and a wisdom rather than fear and apprehension. The Lord bless you. See you next week.